Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 632. Fibroids are the most common cause of hysterectomy. But what are they? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to talk to women or men who are interested in knowing about women's issues. Um, And we're going to talk to women about their uterus, their fibroids, if they have them. But it is so common, I will be talking to three-fourths of the population of women because three-fourths of us do have fibroids. And I had several fibroids in my uterus when they did a hysterectomy, so I'm very aware of what fibroids do, and how they're diagnosed and treated. But as a gynecologist, I diagnose fibroids all the time on our patients that came just for a physical exam. Sometimes I could tell if they had fibroids just by doing a pelvic exam. And a pelvic exam is generally an internal exam where we put two fingers in the vagina and our hand on your abdomen, and we push together, and then we can feel the outline of the uterus. Of course, unless you have a very large abdomen, this is very effective at finding whether your uterus is enlarged. And that's one of the signs that you have fibroids in your uterus. So fibroids can cause uh, pelvic pain. They can cause severe bleeding, uh, vaginal bleeding from the uterus. They can also cause pelvic pressure and painful intercourse because when you have intercourse and your partner bumps against the cervix, it pushes against an enlarged uterus, which then pushes on other things and causes pain. The fibroids can also cause urinary incontinence and pregnancy complications. So all of these problems come from one benign, seemingly very um, safe kind of a growth in your uterus. So what are they? I'm gonna show you a picture here of what fibroids look like but I'll describe them for our listeners who are um, doing their housework or jogging and not watching us. A fibroid is part of the uterine muscle. The the uterus is a uh, a muscular organ. It has muscles that go in three different directions. They um, are meant to be able to clamp down and squeeze the uterus itself, the the muscles are, so that you can stop bleeding if you start to bleed uh, during a period and it gets heavy then the uterus clamps down. You'll feel a type of cramp, but that's what it's doing. It's trying to stop the uterus from bleeding. Now, these muscles uh, are basically in this direction and that direction, so they, they kind of look like a star just in their, um, the muscle organization. But sometimes when we have, uh, I'll talk about the number of risk factors that can cause a fibroid to happen, when we have this happen, uh, the muscle fiber becomes a different kind of muscle, and it does. It has swirls in it. It looks almost like a golf ball when inside the uterine wall. So it's not inside the opening. The uterus is a muscle that has uh, a cavity in it, so that of course we can carry our babies. Uh, it is very distensible. In other words, it can stretch very large because it has to carry a baby. It also can contract very effectively to stop bleeding. But these little fibroids, these little, they can be as small as a marble. They can be as large as a baby. So they can fill a woman's pelvis all the way up to her her, um, chest cavity. Your diaphragm's here, and it divides your chest from your abdomen. You can fill the whole abdominal cavity. And I've seen those before, in fact, taken them out uh, surgically. But fibroids are more than one, more than 99.9% benign. Every once in a while, 
uh, which is very rare, one in a million, you can it will convert into a cancer that we have to treat after we take the fibroid and the uterus out. So that's what a fibroid is. They are called many different names. They're called fibroids. They're called lyomyomas. That means a muscle tumor. They're called myomas. They're called fibroid tumors. And sometimes they're slangly called fireballs. Um, they, in fact, are ball-like. And you can have many of those in your uterus. You can have little tiny ones all over. And you can have um, one great big one that's going to cause you to have all of the problems that I discussed before. When we find fibroids in our office during yearly exams, we're looking at trying to determine how big the uterus is in total because it can make the uterus get very big or round fibroids. Or we can feel irregular parts um, of the uterus that instead of being a kind of a round structure, it can have like ears and those are like fibroids that are on the outside of the uterus. Fibroids um, are, are named so that you can tell where they are. We name them uh, subserosal, serosal means it's under the outside covering of the uterus, so it's out here, and then we have submucosal, which cause the most problem. Submucosal fibroids are, are um, placed right next to the uterine cavity where we collect tissue every month and, and then send the tissue out when we don't get pregnant. But if there's a fibroid right under it, it has a huge blood supply. It doesn't respond to hormones as well as the rest of the uterus. And it can cause a mass problem, meaning it's a mass in there and your uterus can't clamp down and stop bleeding. Sometimes that's the problem and sometimes a submucosal fibroid has big blood vessels that break open and the fibroid itself just bleeds right into the uterine cavity and out the vagina. That's, that's big, that's a big problem. And that is something that um, I've seen a few times, it's not very common for fibroids to do that. You can also have fibroids that, are, that just change the shape of the uterus inside the muscle wall. So that, say this is the outside of the uterus. The, the subserosal are here, the, the intramyometrium is right here, and then the, the submucosal is where they touch the lining or the cavity of the uterus. So that's how we describe fibroids. When I see something on, a, on an ultrasound, I do ultrasounds on every one of my um, hormone replacement patients who are female if they've not had a hysterectomy. And I do that because I want to know if they have fibroids ahead of time. And if they do, I'm going to manage them a little differently and be a little bit more um, conscious of the fact that these fibroids can bleed after menopause if someone is on estrogen. So I want to know where I stand to begin with before, uh, before I um, see a patient and decide on whether they're going to have estrogen or not. And say I saw a patient who had a big fibroid. Well, honestly, I wouldn't give them estrogen. I would, a big fibroid would lead me to send them back to their gynecologist, hold on the estrogen, testosterone safe, it does not cause the fibroids to grow. So it would be something that I would ask the patient before receiving estrogen for um, hormone replacement. I would send them to their gynecologist for evaluation and treatment, and we'll discuss those areas in a, in a bit. Um, sometimes I see a lot of little tiny ones that probably are not gonna be affected by the estrogen, and then we try it, but we usually give a slightly lower estrogen dose and see if that causes us trouble. If I find that there's a fibroid on the submucosal side, the one that's most likely to bleed and cause trouble, then I am going to discuss this with the patient and tell them that this is a risk of heavy bleeding. And then they can decide if they wanna have, take that risk or not. Um, a few times we've had patients that by some, for some reason they either got a, an undiagnosable uh, uh, ultrasound where we can't, the pictures don't tell us anything and there's no report. And in those cases, we always ask them to either get the original report or 
uh, actually go to the gynecologist and get another ultrasound that is actually read by the gynecologist or a radiologist so we know where we stand. So th that's something that we do just to make sure we know where we are and we can make our decisions and treatment based on that. So what causes women to have fibroids? <clears throat> We've had, um, there's been a lot of research. The most common uh, cause, well, let me just list the causes. Race, uh, it's much more common in uh, African-American or black women than it is in white women. Um, genetics, family history, if your mother had fibroids, you're more likely to have them. And we now know several different genetic mutations that cause somebody to have fibroids. Um, diet, diet that, that is heavy in um, uh, animal protein, animal fat, because there's a lot of toxins in animal fat. And uh, sugar, uh, of course, sugar is the, the biggest problem in many cases. Um, if you had your, started your periods earlier than, say, 11, the average age is 12, or it's going down rapidly, but, but if you've had, a, had your periods before you were 11, then you're more likely to have a fibroid during some time during your life, not when you're a kid, but later. Um, toxins in the environment are getting more and more uh, relative to medicine, and toxins have been found to change the stem cells within the uterus when people are exposed to them, and especially if they're young when they're exposed to toxins. And the toxins can change the genes and make fibroids uh, grow and occur at a later date. Um, obesity, obesity is big. If you're overweight, if your BMI is over 30, you're at a higher risk of having um, a lot of fibroids, one fibroid, but you're at risk of having fibroids if you're obese because fat, makes estrone, which is the old lady estrogen, and it can make estradiol too. So it increases your estrogen that you're producing, and it actually can feed the fibroid to make it grow. Uh, if, you are, if you have polycystic ovaries and you don't uh, have periods all the time, that means you're estrogen dominant and you're not making progesterone, that can also cause the fibroids to grow. Fibroids are more common as we get older, especially between 40 and 50, right before menopause, because we are estrogen dominant during that time. If, if uh, when we're estrogen dominant, we don't make progesterone. Progesterone makes the fibroids behave and not grow. Estrogen makes them grow. So whenever I have a fibroid uterus, I always provide uh, a prescription for a natural progesterone to counteract the growth factor of, of estradiol for that fibroid. So you can see I need to know if somebody has them and I need to, and if somebody all of a sudden didn't have them and all of a sudden does, then I have to have that evaluated to see uh, whether I can still give estrogen or not to the patient. There's a few new things that we found out about fibroids that increase your risk and that is vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D is essential to almost every function in your body. But if you have a vitamin D deficiency, you are much more likely as a woman to have uh, a fibroid or have many fibroids and have them grow. High blood pressure. High blood pressure, even if you're taking a medication and you have high blood pressure, that is much more common to have fibroids in your uterus if you do. It's a risk factor. And then um, if you've had a lot of pregnancies, you would think that would be worse, but it's better because pregnancy is a progesterone dominant type of situation and the progesterone makes fibroids shrink, estrogen makes them grow, and in pregnancy, the progesterone environment makes the fibroids smaller or keeps them from growing. So the more pregnancies you have, the better in, in regard to fibroids. Now, the, um, what are the symptoms of uterine fibroids? I, I started to uh, discuss that, but um, Say you don't, get a, you don't get an ultrasound to see if you have fibroids or not, and then you get placed on estrogen replacement therapy because getting an ultrasound before estrogen replacement therapy is more than standard of care. Most people don't do that with their patients, don't ask them to get an ultrasound because it's not part of the, of the guidelines from OBGYN. So say you didn't know if you had fibroids or not, and then all of a sudden um, you start having heavy bleeding. Well, heavy bleeding can come from estrogen stimulating fibroids, but it can come from other things. It can come from something called adenomyosis, which is a spongy-like uterus. After lots of pregnancies, whether they go to term or not, 
the placenta worms its way into the lining of or into the muscle of the uterus and makes it spongy, kind of makes um, uh, inroads, but they they kind of look like when, if you're at the lake that you have all these little coves coming out from the lake. It's kind of like that. They they make openings in the muscle, and every time you have a period before menopause, they fill up, and then you have periods where you have a cramp, and they basically cause you to push out a lot a, a lot of blood. So that's adenomyosis, and, and the fibroids can also cause uh, heavy bleeding. It just is different. It, it isn't necessarily the gushing blood. It's usually just constant bleeding. If you have a new pelvic pain or pressure, feel like you have to go to the bathroom all the time, but your uter your excuse me, your bladder is fine, it may be that your uterus is growing filled with fibroids. So we do an ultrasound. So ultrasound is key to any of these problems or symptoms that I'm describing. Um, you can have urine loss, a new episode of urine loss where all of a sudden, you know, you are continent and then all of a sudden every time you cough and sneeze, you lose urine. That can be from a fibroid that's sitting on your bladder. Painful intercourse, of course, if there's a mass that is in the uterus, when you have intercourse, your, your partner is going to push on that uterus and then the uterus is going to push against other organs and it hurts. So that pelvic pain is another sign that you have fibroids. If you've had multiple miscarriages, that can be lack of progesterone or that can be um, uh, genetic causes or it can be fibroids. It can be many other things as well, but those are the most common. If you have preterm labor, often a fibroid will cause preterm labor because it just makes the, the uterus big, even bigger than it was secondary to being pregnant. And then um, sometimes if when you have fibroids and you gain a lot of weight, you're making more internal estrogen, which is then stimulating fibroids to grow. So weight gain is also another, uh, another sign that you, have, you might have fibroids if you start bleeding heavily. So how do we find fibroids? What do we do uh, as doctors to find them? And I've said ultrasound. The first way we f try to find them, if we're gynecologists and practicing that, is to feel the uterus. It's why I want my patients to have had a gynecologic exam before they come to see me for hormone replacement. So, um, so that's one of the reasons. I want to make sure the uterus is normal size. Then I get an ultrasound that also measures the size of the uterus to make sure it's normal size and not enlarged. It looks for fibroids. It looks for other things that can make women bleed, like polyps or adenomyosis or um, blo a blocked cervix that would collect a lot of, of blood and then it just seeps out, kind of drips out. So that all of those things can be seen in a pelvic ultrasound. We do two of them. We do an abdominal pelvic ultrasound to see if we can see all of the uterus with the, with the vaginal ultrasound. And it's better at measuring the size of the uterus itself. But when we want to look on the inside of the uterus, we do a vaginal probe ultrasound. And that means that the, a probe about this long, about that big, goes into the vagina and looks at the uterus looks inside the uterus, tells us how thick the lining is, if there's any fibroids, and then looks at each ovary to make sure that they're healthy as well. So ultrasound is key to evaluating fibroids. Um, <clears throat> so when we look at uteruses and look for the size, a 12-week size uterus is within your pelvic cavity. You shouldn't be able to feel it up on your abdomen it's, it's below your pubic bone, so you wouldn't normally be able to feel that above it. But we do say this uterus is the size of a 12-week pregnancy, or we say this is, uterus is the size of a 16-week pregnancy. Now, 16 weeks is, goes up on your abdomen between your belly button and your pubic bone, so that's about halfway. A 20-week pregnancy size uterus goes all the way to your belly button, and fibroids can get that big. Multiple ones are just one. And they can actually go up underneath your, your breastbone. They can be that big. So it can mimic pregnancy. So what type of treatment can we use to do this? I mean, short of taking the whole uterus out, um, 
what kind of treatment is needed at each size in each size range. First, um, we can control fibroid growth in most cases with progesterone. By giving my patients progesterone, when I give them estrogen, or even without estrogen, I can keep the fibroids from growing. So progesterone is a good treatment first. In people who are premenopausal and have fibroids, we give them birth control pills. Birth control pills are estrogen and progestin, and they are actually uh, feedback to your pituitary to lower your estrogen level. They also lower your progesterone level, but they lower both of those hormones so that they are not feeding fibroids. Uh, a more radical treatment, and I've had this treatment several times uh, when I was trying to get pregnant after my first child, and I had something called Lupron. Um, and that's, there are other drugs with the same, um, in the same family, but they basically go to your pituitary and they make your pituitary, they block, block the estrogen that makes you make more estrogen, and they go to your pituitary and, and it, and they tell you, your body, to stop making estrogen. They put you into a false menopause. You get hot flashes, you get night sweats, you gain weight, uh, but by putting you into menopause with no hormones for a period of time, then the fibroids usually shrink. I've had a couple times when I put people on that and their fibroids did not shrink. Um, Lupron's used for other things, but in this case, we use it in the case of fibroids, we use it to shrink the fibroids. Now, there's a drug I use a lot, and that's called anastrozole, or the um, brand name is Arimidex. It is something that stops testosterone from converting into estrogen and feeding fibroids. And we do that all the time. If we, find, if we have a patient with fibroids, we offer them or treat them with Arimidex in their pellet. Usually that works better than oral. It has fewer side effects. Side effects being the kind of side effects you'd get with menopause if you're not on any estrogen. So it blocks the production of estrogen from testosterone. Um, I usually, if I have fibroids that appear to be growing, I, I talk to the patient and say, well, we can give you testosterone. That doesn't affect the growth of fibroids. But uh, would you agree to not getting estrogen? And many of them say, I need my estrogen. I'd rather have a hysterectomy then not have estrogen because I'm so miserable without it. That's the patient's choice. She has to sign a high-risk consent or she has to just verbalize that to me and then we know and document that, um, that she wants to have estrogen anyway because of her quality of life and that she, is, she knows she's at risk for a hysterectomy down the line if she does. Um, we treat inflammation. Inflammation can make fibroids grow. Sometimes the more uh, fat you have on your body, the more inflammation you have on your body. So if somebody has a lot of inflammation and their fibroids are growing, we try to get them to lose weight. But, or we treat inflammation with something like aspirin, or um, we can even um, use Motrin or, or over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, which will decrease inflammation and will decrease the growth sometimes. Honestly, that hasn't been part of my protocol because, honestly, I don't it hasn't really worked, so we in general don't do that routinely. Vitamin D is critical to keeping you from having fibroids, so we replace vitamin D. We give people probiotics. That is key to keeping fibroids from growing, is giving back, giving your intestines the right bacteria so that you can be hormonally stable, and the probiotics help you do that. Uh, and last is uh, vitamins and minerals. By giving you the nutrition you need and not having uh, and avoiding um, uh, the kind of food that you get at like the baseball games or in the center aisles of the of the grocery store, all of the uh, food that is in a package has all kinds of other chemicals in it to keep it uh, uh, its shelf life fine. So, for um, we always discuss diet and make sure that our patients are on a healthy diet. And if they aren't, that's, it's up to them to do that. I can't go home with them. Okay. Last but not least, how do we treat fibroids once we, once we find out that they're big, they're bleeding, we can't get them to stop with any of these other treatments? Uh, what treatments are available? 
Well, the, one of the newer ones is that you can have a uterine artery embolization. What that means is the arteries that go to the uterus can, uh, under a fluoroscope with a radiologist, actually be bl blocked, their blood flow can be stopped or plugged up. So the radiologist uses a catheter to go to wherever the source of the bleeding is and, and bleeding or blood flow into the uterus. And he finds that one fibroid and he finds the blood flow and he puts a plug in it. Basically what that does is that makes the fibroid shrink down. And because it's not getting any blood flow, it's not being kept alive. So it basically takes that fibroid and makes it shrink. If you have multiple fibroids, this is not a very practical solution because they, they grow into each other. It's almost impossible to find multiple fibroid blood supplies to plug them up. Now, another uh, method of uh, surgically treating fibroids is um, a myomectomy. A myomectomy means we're taking out the fibroid, but we're leaving the uterus. In general, this is used for people who have not finished having children, that they're still cycling, that they're still fertile, but they're having trouble getting pregnant or they're miscarrying over and over again because they have this mass effect, this fibroid sitting there in the uterus that's keeping them from getting pregnant. So the myomectomy is a surgery, much like a hysterectomy, you have to be opened or you have to have a laparoscope kind of a procedure. So then what happens is your doctor goes in and opens up the area around the fibroid and then takes it out and then repairs the uterus. The good news is you don't have to have a hysterectomy and you can try to get pregnant at that point. But the bad news is you have an incision in your uterus in the th usually the thicker part of the uterus, not like a C-section, which is the incisions in the, in the thinner part of the lower uterine segment. When you cut into the thicker part of the uterus, you're creating a weakness for when a person gets pregnant, she most likely will not be able to tolerate labor because that could cause the uterus to explode. So we, uh, in general, deliver babies by C-section for patients who have had a myomectomy, but they have a baby. So it's, so that's great. Now, last but not least is a hysterectomy, and that can be done in many different ways, but a hysterectomy means removal of the uterus. It has nothing to do with your ovaries. It, if you have your ovaries removed for a different reason, they have a mass, they have endometriosis, you are in the menopausal age group and some doctors remove ovaries just because you're a certain age. That's called a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. It's a mouthful. A hysterectomy is just the removal of the uterus. A total hysterectomy is a removal of the uterus and the cervix through an incision. Uh, but you can also have a supracervical or above the cervix hysterectomy where you take out the uterus. As long as there's no fibroids in the cervix, you can take the uterus out but leave the cervix. And the reason that would be and that's only okay if you haven't had abnormal PAPs and you haven't had uterine cancer, you haven't had pre-cancer, excuse me, cervical cancer, and you, you can't leave the cervix if you've had those things and you're at risk for them. But if you've never had any of those things, we can leave the cervix and it gives you better support, but it also improves your response to um, sexual stimulation of the cervix because it's still there and it still has the nerves going to it. So... Those types of hysterectomies are the way that we treat fibroids finally, in the end, to take care of, to take care of all of the bleeding, the growth, the pain, any of those things. We can take the uterus out and then you're done with it, which is good, but it's all also the last resort. So if you have fibroids, now you can have an educated conversation with your doctor about what to do, how to manage them. Now you know that you can take estrogen if you take progesterone with it, or if you take estrogen, you can take it with a Arimidex and block the, uh, the growth of your fibroids. Um, and you can talk to your doctor with a, an educated view of this. So this will, if you didn't catch it all because I was talking too fast, then this will also be, this information will be in my blog. 
uh, on our website, biobalancehealth.com. And um, I'm hoping that this gave you some hope about dealing with this and that you have a lot of company. Three out of four women have this. I mean, it's a huge group and it's the most common cause of hysterectomy. So I hope you learned something today that might help you in your own health and talking to your doctor. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.